Hi, I'm John Cracky. I'm the writer of Home Free. Uh, you can find me at johncracky.com where all my social media links are. And you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hi, my name is Michelle Lodge. I am the artist on Home Free. And you can find me at comiclodge.com. And you are listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined by two very talented co-creators of an amazing series called Home Free, which has three issues currently already published, and they are working on a crowdfunding campaign for issue number four. We're joined by John Cracky <laughs> and Michelle Lodge. How are you both doing today? I'm good, man. Really good. Really good. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I'm a comic artist currently working on the Home Free series that we're talking about now, of course. And I've been working on comics for a um, very long time, but uh, more seriously in the past 10 years. So that's why I'm here today. Over to you, John. Yeah, my name is John Cracky. I am a, a writer primarily, uh, and I've been writing comics for, I don't know, probably about 15, 16 years, maybe a little bit more. Just started out with web comics, just always been self-publishing. Um, Michelle and I uh, originally worked on a series called The Black Wall together, and we decided we wanted to get into the Kickstarter thing. She jumped in first with her own uh, series, um, got that funded, and we were like, oh, we, we should do this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so we came up with Home Free together. It's, it's a loose sequel to The Black Wall but um, done in a way where you don't necessarily need to know the black wall um, so that when you finally read the black wall, it can be, you can find surprises of, you know, what's happening, how it's connected and all that. Yeah. That's, that's me. What is the synopsis then of home free? Home free is about a woman named Sarah. She meets in the first issue. She meets a girl named Emmy in a bar. Emmy's down on her luck. She is a prostitute and she is locked into a bad situation with an abusive pen. Um, Sarah has some relation to this from her own past, and essentially they connect pretty well, pretty fast, and she decides, hey, let's get you out of here. Sarah's also ready to move on with her life. Uh, she's been in this this town called Coos Bay for a while, and just things have not been going nowhere for her. So um, Sarah, she's really good at running, running away from problems, not really exactly solving them, um, and so that's that's what she does with Emmy, and it, the adventure starts from there and goes to some pretty dark places. Uh, basically, um, Sarah, there's also a background story about um, just with Amer within America, there's some really bad stuff going on, and there's like all these different factions kind of rising up and basically get, getting into like a near not exactly civil war type situation, but a situation where there's going to be some violence. Um, so Sarah's also not only running from her problems, but kind of running away from all the stuff that's going on and trying to get down to Mexico. So it's basically a road trip crime adventure comic, kind of. Single white female and uh, Blues Brothers? No. That's... Could, could be. <laughs> Just less, less comedy. <laughs> it's, it's there a little bit, but a little darker. <laughs> You know, Michelle, when you worked on the script with John here, what was the first image that kind of popped into your mind that made you start this particular story off with a bang? Oh, gosh. It's hard to say exactly. I don't think there's one thing that stood out to me, you know, th throughout the whole script. It was more of like how it read as a whole and like Sarah's journey and her character that is inspiring for me as an artist to like, Ooh, I want to draw this character. Yeah. I think it was more of that than a, than a particular scene. Sarah actually is a character that's from um, the black wall, which we worked on previously. So it was basically taking her character design and growing her up and kind of imagining all the things she had been through up to this point in her life and where she's at now and sort of envisioning, you know, 
what she would look like, her what her expressions would look like, how she would cut her hair now, and what she would choose to wear. I had fun with it. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Obviously, you've uh, worked both well together here, and this is for, this is for both of you. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power, and it doesn't have to be words per se; it could also be art as well, too. Oh. Hmm, that's a good one. Uh, language had power. Um, I would say just growing up with the movies I watched, you know, you know, I'm a big Martin Scorsese fan, uh, Quentin Tarantino, those guys. And like, you know, when you listen to their dialogue and you hear certain lines and you just like, they either, you know, they, they make you laugh, especially after something dark happens in a story, you know, when they can lighten the mood with a line or, um, you know, darken the mood with the line, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, I think just being an avid movie fan and just, you know, when you hear the actual dialogue um, and get to connect that language to a character in that way um, and where you can like feel the whole mood of a movie change. I think that's, that's a time where you really understand the power of language, you know, it, it just makes, you know, it becomes very meaningful, you know. I actually, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Like dialogue is so important when it's good. It really like, you're there, you're drawn into these characters. You're like, what are they going to say next? I'm into it. I'm, you know, it's entertaining. When the dialogue is bad, it's it t totally takes you away from the story and just uh, to me anyway, but yeah, good to, Dialogue is everything in storytelling. Favorite dialogue from a movie or series that you quote in real life on a maybe not daily basis, but that you happen to pull out of your repertoire. Oh man, uh, I feel kind. Of, I, I feel kind of bad because I'm not a quoter of movies. Like I, I'm an avid movie fan. I love them, but I actually I don't pick up on using. Uh, quotes on life it just it's never been my thing but I love it when other people do it you know like because I don't know it's just like uh it you know used in the right moment it could be very funny you know I gotta say I don't think I do that often you know I hate to disappoint like with uh, that answer but it's just <laughs> It's, it's the truth. <laughs> yeah, I, I just don't often use uh, movie dialogue in my life. It's just one of those things. I don't know. I find your lack of faith disturbing. That's, that's <laughs> oh, you know what? You know what? You know what? That's not true. I, whenever I talk to, uh, I I'm a supervisor at my job, right? And sometimes I'll use some, I'll throw some Yoda in there. There you go. I'll definitely throw some Yoda in there and like just say things like Yoda, just to I don't know, make people laugh or roll their eyes at least, you know. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, for me. Um... No, I, I don't do a lot of quoting either, but I'll sometimes use lines from like Back to the Future. I love I love that series and Fifth Element every now and then. <laughs> Multi-pass is a given. You know. Yes. You both obviously have a crowdfunding campaign currently ongoing here as well too for issue four of your amazing series so far. What are you looking forward to accomplishing with this particular series, with this particular campaign compared to say your past campaigns, including like from uh, the black wall and things like that? I think with this one, uh, you know, it's always about building a readership and getting more people reading your, uh, your work. Uh, you know, we've been, I would say moderately, moderately successful on our past campaigns. A big number for me is just to get past that 100 backer count. You know, it's really important to just kind of keep building. Success was obviously getting it done, you know, fulfilling your campaign, getting those books out there um, and all that. But, but I feel like success for this one really will feel um, even better if we can just kind of get past that hurdle. And just like, you know, we've got a lot of plans and there's a lot of campaigns to come. So just like, as long as we're building every single campaign, um, I just want to get the books in people's hands, you know, just get, get them and get people reading them and enjoying them. And so we can just keep on because doing this kind of like um, we like to call it dramatic crime fiction. That's kind of like our brand uh, that we do together. The black, that's what the black wall was. Uh, that's what home free is. And we've got already got a book planned for the future that is right up that um, crime noir uh, dramatic fiction alley. 
What are some of the tiers that you're you're looking at in terms of giving uh, those that are backing this particular campaign for issue four? Is there anything different from past campaigns? Is there something new that is a fan favorite? Anything like that? Every campaign we do like a funding goal package, get those milestones like 25% funded, 50% funded, 75% funded. It adds a little bit more to the package for the people that are funding it. Um, so we always have like a brand new bookmark that we give away. We have a brand new sticker that we give away. It's usually like the logo with like an important, you know, artifact from the, the particular issue. Um, but my favorite is the noir postcard. So basically because this is a road trip, Michelle creates a uh, noir postcard. We did a cruise bay one. We did just kind of a camping in Oregon one. Uh, we did one for Nevada last time. And then since uh, Sarah's going to be in San Diego at this point, we've got a San Diego. For, I guess we're going to have to do two San Diegos because the comic is five issues and the um, last two issues are almost like one long part. We'll do a San Diego one this time. And um, that's that's one of my favorite things to do. I always just look forward to like, we have that in there just so I can see what Michelle comes up with for the postcards because they're always so cool because it's not just about like, you know, that location. There's always some kind of like element of crime or something kind of snuck into the picture to just make it a little, you know, dark, you know? So they're, they're really fun. I was going to say, what's the nostalgia about postcards for you, Michelle? Oh yeah. There's something fun about those old retro postcards that have the like, welcome to, you know, wherever. And also getting a postcard in the mail is so rare that when it happens, like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Surprise in the mail. I don't know. They're just fun. From the artistic side of things, though, you, you get to stretch your creativity, even though it's in a, a small area to work from as well, too. I'm sure you could easily go into like a 3D depth with a lot of the stuff as well, too, because people just think of a postcard as a 2D perspective. But you have, you must have a lot of free, freedom to work with this. Yeah, I try to make it as interesting as possible. And, and also, yeah, I do like combining the dark aspect of what's actually happened in this location with the cheery oh welcome to this place come to this wonderful place where terrible things happen uh, the the merging of those two vibes i really i like that it's a black and white and i think for me uh, out of all the creators that i i talk to those that work in black and white are probably is one of some of the most detail oriented artists that I've ever come across because you can't hide behind the color. What is it about black and white that pushes your boundaries and pushes your creativity as an artist? Oh man. Um, I think, I think black and white can be so unique and interesting. Not saying that I do this, the best or anything like that i'm just <laughs> like when i look at uh frank miller's work in sin city it's just so cool how you know he just pulls out these little white areas and it's like i know exactly what that is even though it's just like a few shapes here and there but it's so beautifully done and so yeah, black and white can be so interesting depending on whose style is coming through with it. One thing I'd like to say about Michelle's uh, work is that, that I love so much about it is sometimes black and white can look so flat on the page. I feel like with her work, when you're looking at a panel, there's so much depth there. Like you're looking all the way into like a scene. I wish I can throw some up right now that like um, I'm thinking of in my head. But as you read the comic, you'll just see what I'm talking about. Like she like really creates this awesome depth within each panel within her black and white. It's, just, it's not flat. There's a lot of depth there, I guess, because it's so raw, too, because it's, you know, there's no color to enhance like the character's faces or anything. You know how her characters are feeling. You know how what they're thinking or like, you know, the mood they're in and that you can see it all on their face with the work she does. It's really awesome work, man. I, I can't say enough nice things about Michelle's work. Thank you. <laughs> Looking at the first issue to this current issue and not to give any spoilers away with issue four, obviously, but both in writing and in art, how have you both grown in your respective areas as a writer and as an artist from issue one to issue three? Oh. <laughs> Do you want to go first? I, well, I was going to say, like, <laughs> man, 
issue one starts off pretty tame, you know, and then slowly ratchets up in action each issue. So <laughs> issue one, I'm already working on my art skills there, but then issue two is like, okay, now we've got some action scenes, these fight scenes and stuff. And then issue three is like, okay, let's throw in like a mob and then like explosion. I don't want to give anything away, but mm -hmm. like as an artist, like, <laughs> let's just get crazier and crazier each issue. <laughs> let's see what you can do, you know, but it's, it's a great challenge for me. It's been really fun to work on scenes and sequences that I've not done before. So I'll say that. Yeah, I, I kind of felt bad actually giving Michelle like issue fours because <laughs> to issue four, we're not like, because it's been pretty isolated, you know, we're like in this small city, then we're like, we're on the road through like a winding mountain pass in the woods. And then we're like in the desert and it's like, there's what, two, three characters, you know, uh -huh. and the third one, then all of a sudden like four just explodes. We're in a city, there's riots happening. It's kind of like urban warfare. There's helicopters and just people <laughs> everywhere. And I was just like, man, this is, I, I'm just like, I feel bad. Like I, just cause there's, I know the amount of work that is going to go into this comic is just going to be like insane so so michelle's just really you know she's taken on each one like you know issue three like i really liked issue three because it became that's like the most personal it's like just in the desert it's very lonely it's in the dark it's almost the opposite of the uh issue four you know in scope but for writing you know with this series uh just like i've never really written a series like this before where there's like usually i just i don't stop myself inhibit myself to like how i write and i'm trying to write episodes now like basically 24 page things this new one's 32 pages and usually like like with the black wall the chapters were just like however long they needed to be i think i really enjoy writing a page limit because it like it makes me have to work harder to put everything in that story in that smaller amount of pages, you know. So that's been the biggest challenge for me with Home Free, and I had a little um, experience already with our previous project. That's going to be our next project. So that that's been the biggest challenge, and just it, being able to I think meet it with each episode. So I've really enjoyed that process, and I look I actually look forward to. I used to not want to write like that. I was just like, I'll write however long the chapter needs to be. But now I kind of look forward to it because I think it's it's harder to do, and it ultimately makes for a, a more a, like a better story that's better better paced. And you're not killing Michelle over you know I need you right. to draw fifty horses <laughs> or whatever the case may be, or something right. like that. Only one horse in the black wall. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> What's the hardest thing for you to draw, Michelle, that you just really dread whenever you see it in a script? I am curious. Oh, I don't know that there's anything I dread. Maybe, ooh. <laughs> I think it turned out well, but the helicopter over the crowd, I was just like, oh, how am I going to do this? Crowd scenes are hard, even though people is what I love to draw. <laughs> a ton of people in one small panel is hard. I but, think you met the challenge on the helicopter panel. I, th yes. I think it looks great, man. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So now then, now note to self, if you're ever mad at Michelle and you're working together on a project, draw, write in lots of vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, vehicles are not my favorite. But I, I don't dread, you know, I'm not sure I dread drawing anything. I interviewed um, Jill Thompson a while back and she said the only way an artist can get good at becoming an artist is to draw everything and say yes to everything. And it was uh, it was an interesting concept from either commercial to personal art to comic books. So that makes sense. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Oh, man. God, I hate to uh, pause on this to think about it. Oh, I'm trying to think. Keeping in mind that failure is part of success, I think for me was something to keep in mind and that kind of prevents me from stopping myself from trying. I like that advice. I've definitely. 
myself, you know, I've, I've definitely failed before, but you know, like you, you learn a lot from that just cause, um, at one point in my life, I took on too many projects at once. Right. And I had like three projects going and I had to, I had to stop one of them and I stopped it midway and I felt terrible. Like I had this whole script written, but I had to stop it. Um, and I could, I, that was the first comic I just couldn't finish. And I was like, I'm never doing that again. Like I, I can handle multiple things, but at the time I had to pay too many people or something, you know, there was just too much going on and I just had to stop one of them because it just didn't make sense anymore. So I think I learned to kind of juggle that a little better and really put the focus in, in one area because also I wasn't able to really promote three comics going at once. I didn't have the skills for that. It didn't make sense to do and I'll never do that again. So <laughs> I'm just gonna go with Michelle's advice, you know? I'm gonna take it as I just learned that right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that. What was the first thing that you created that made you realize, yes, I could do this as a profession? I kind of, I release everything under like this um, imprint, like called Coffee Time Comics. My first comic I ever did was Coffee Time. And it was like a really fun comic to work on. Uh, it's just me and my friend Tobias, we just threw everything in there, like all our influences. And it was just a very simple thing. And it was really fun. After that, I did another one with Tobias called Across the Way. It was something I wrote that wasn't just like kind of a silly, fun thing. Like Coffee Time had heart and it had its stories and stuff. But then Across the Way, like I really took a story. I did, it was my first time doing a crime story. It was about this veteran who came home and, you know, all his friends were, you know, still into the same old, like, you know, whatever they were doing, de dealing drugs, doing drugs, blah, 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 all the, all the, just a bunch of garbage, like just living crazy lives on the edge of things. And um, he just wanted to like change his life, you know, you know, I touched on a lot of stuff about 9-11 and all these things and kind of got really deep with the characters and stuff. And I just felt like, wow, man, like, I'm, I feel like, you know, I'm really writing something that like means a lot in my life right now. Cause this was really fresh. It was like 2000, five no 2006 seven around there so it was really kind of still close to 2001 iraq and i get afghanistan were still in the public's mind a lot and just writing that story just you know i felt like i really wrote something that was like kind of had a deeper meaning to me and i was like yeah I, if i keep on writing this style i feel like i can push myself and just see see what else i can come up with you know i think across the way is probably the one tobias gebhardt um he's still a really good friends friends with me we're gonna have a table together at rose city comic con but he does tattoos now and he does he does more like prints and stuff he doesn't really do comics anymore yeah we've just been friends forever he did a variant cover for issue two of home free so you know still 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 good friends i don't think there's one specific work that i made that sort of changed my mind about art. I just grew up in a creative home. So, you know, my dad was a magician and then my mom's a painter. So as I'm like interested in drawing, they just were like, yeah, this can be a career. So it was just about channeling my interests into the creative job that you know, where I'm at now, I guess. <laughs> it's good to have support, especially if from parents and significant others and everything like that as well, too, whether you're yeah. a writer or an artist. It makes your day go by a lot better, I think. Is there a comic that made you feel the way you hope readers of your work will feel after reading it? I feel like my answer is very cliche. After I read The Watchmen, you know, I was oh. just blown away, man. Like, like I'd never read anything like that. I hadn't, you know, I stopped reading comics for years. And then, you know, I was reading comics like in the 80s. My, my uncle would just give me all his comics when he was done reading them, which was really cool. And then there was a while I started buying more underground comics, like the Freak Brothers reprints and stuff like that. But then I just kind of stopped for a little while. And then I met somebody, I think when I moved to Los Angeles, like, and they were telling me about Watchmen and, they were kind of introducing me to different comics like Sandman and stuff. And I was like, Oh my God. Like I remember reading Watchmen and just being just blown away. Cause I haven't read a superhero comic. And I know that existed at a time when I was reading comics. I just didn't know about it, you know? And I just never read anything like that before. I just loved how like deep the world was. Um, and I'd always wanted to just make a comic that's not that story, but like that really, 
goes in deep, you know, with the, the pirate story in there and then just like the letters and stuff, the, the little things in between the, the narrative from the biography, all that stuff. It's been a couple of years since I've read it now, so I'm forgetting the details. But yeah, I think that's, you know, that's the one that really just blew my mind and was like, ah, I want to do this. You know, I can write, I, well, I can't write like that, but I can try to write like this, you know. Uh, so many came into my mind. Basically, I, after someone reads our comics, I just want them to feel entertained, excited, and just with a sense of like, well, and then wanting more. There are a lot of comics that did that for me. <laughs> Lady Killer, I thought was really cool. Um, by Joelle Jones, Blankets by Craig Thompson. That's a whole different vibe, but that book just is incredibly unique and beautiful and gives that excitement of, oh my gosh, this is just a beautiful work. I'm so happy someone made this. Black Hole by Charles Burns. Oh, yeah. That one's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, also The Sculptor by McLeod. So many inspirations. It's an amazing right. time to be a creative person. So much history we can draw from and, and draw upon to make whatever works we decide to make. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Uh, my dad. Um, definitely when I was younger. He just introduced me to a lot of cool stuff. Like he, my dad was a movie buff. He loved science fiction films. And he would always like, just when I was a little kid, like he would show me clips from movies. That obviously I couldn't watch the whole thing of, you know, like, like he would show me like um, the world war two zombie scene from heavy metal. Um, and then he would show me, you know, just things like that. Just things that would just like have my imagination going wild at like a young age. You know, I remember sitting down watching Preacher from the Black Lagoon with him, just like like Godzilla movies and all that stuff. And just, he really got me into that mode of just loving like films and comics and, you know, just stuff like that. He was an avid reader. So he really inadvertently um, just kind of put me on the path to like, you know, liking all that stuff like they would always champion my drawing when i was a kid when i used to actually draw you know once i started saying i wanted to write stuff he would give me ideas like hey write this story and you know have me sit down and write it and then you know my older age they just always kind of supported me even when it was just like obviously wasn't really doing anything i was trying with these comics and stuff he was just always there to support me on it all so i would say yeah my father got me so interested in all the things i love today well, the person that's coming to mind for me that I'm inspired by is my sister. And she's not in the creative field, but it's just her way she solves problems, the way she, her work ethic, her attitude toward life and how she problem solves. And she always keeps her eyes forward and like on like a bigger goal. So her attitude of just like positivity and going through any obstacles as if like, yeah, okay, that was no problem. I am very inspired by her and obstacles that I have met with in my art career, which is um, not an easy field. Um, you have to have a pretty thick skin to go forward in it i have very much looked to her and how she handles life taking a lot of inspiration from her from a professional standpoint you have both created of course blackwall and three of these issues now issue number four with this series you're going to have another one after that so and you've both done i'm sure many professional works that we haven't had time to talk about today, which means you both have to come back on and talk about your creativity another time on the show. I'd be happy to have you both on. Professionally, you are successful in that regard. Do you consider yourselves personally successful? It's a hard one to answer. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it's just, it depends on what your level of success is. I think I'm very successful 
at busting my ass and working hard and trying to make these things happen and putting the time into it and also balancing my life uh, outside of that with like, you know, taking care of my mother, going to work 40 plus hours a week, uh, you know, uh, making time for my wife who is incredibly supportive of this crazy stuff that I do. So I think in those regards of trying to balance all that, you know, there's little failures like and all that, but you know, that's, that's where the success lies for me. And on the level we're getting it done. Me and Michelle are definitely getting it done, you know? Um, and I feel like, yes, we we have had successful Kickstarters. We're slowly growing a base of people that enjoy our work. And I think it'll continue to grow as we find, figure out all the ways you get that stuff out there. But professionally on the level of creating comics, I don't feel that success, success yet. Like, I don't, know if it ever becomes easy like i don't know if that's something to judge it by but when it starts becoming a little easier and hey i have to work 20 hours now instead of 40 hours and you know i have to work zero hours and i can just make comics all the time um that's for me you know really where i want to be at so and i know it's going to take uh probably a couple of years to get there but i think that's the real success that i'm looking for but i feel successful in the fact that I know who I am and I know what I do and uh, I know how to keep it going, you know? That was an awesome answer. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> now, now it's your turn, Michelle. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I actually, this is a really hard question to answer because I, I agree a lot with what John said. You know, it's kind of like some, some I do feel like I'm being successful at what I'm doing and and yet other days it's rough because I'm looking at where I want to be eventually. And I'm, you know, at this point here, I want to be at this point here someday. It's hard to some days look at that point and then sit from where I'm at now and, and feel successful. But I do feel that we're definitely on the right road. So I feel really positive and, I don't know, solid. So I guess that would be success. Hey, it's, it's however we feel from a minimized in a basis, personally. So it is what it is. <laughs> to take the small wins, I say. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Not in good ways. Yeah, I, was gonna say. <laughs> I, I beat myself up, man. Like, you know, it's it's just the natural thing. And I try not to because I know it doesn't help. It doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't do anything good. It doesn't do anything good to dwell on it. Ultimately, you just have to fix it. You know, you have to look at what you were doing wrong or, you know, why, you know, like, you know, take a day where you expect to get all these things done. You know, why didn't I get it all done? And maybe sometimes the conclusion is just like, maybe you weren't supposed to get all that done. You only have four hours, you know, it's like, you, you, know, you only have so much time. So it's, I think the best way to deal with failures is to fix the problem and actually look at it, take out a notebook, kind of sketch out what you were doing and just, you know, just not in a daily thing, but essentially I beat myself up by also try to fix the problem. And I try not to get too negative on it. I, you know, I try to distract myself from that because it's just so important not to let yourself just drown in those kind of thoughts. But you got to fix it because otherwise you're just going to keep on beating yourself up. Depending on how big the failure was, mm -hmm. I'll let myself feel that emotionally, which is generally just a bunch of tears. Take a day to step away and then try to take in what happened and learn from it and then do better next time. Yeah. I think stepping away, I agree with that too. Cause like when you're doing all this stuff on your own, you, there's so many roles you have to play. And if you don't let yourself breathe once in a while, especially you just, you're going to get lost in it and you got to let yourself breathe and take that time off once in a while, because you know, you've already, you already got so many things going on in your life that you have to juggle. Um, so I think that's an important thing, especially with, if you fail a little bit, you know, just that's, that's maybe the quiet time to think about it too. You know, the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or a writer or an artist. And the fact that 
you have the younger generation with you looking up to you as a creative person. Maybe you're inspiring them on their path to some creative endeavor in the future. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Hmm. I think uh, momentum. You know, when I see people that are indie creators that just keep that work coming and like they just have this crazy momentum of, uh, you know, releasing stuff and like, you know, you really watch them build it. Like, I think it, as long as they learn that stuff, because like, I feel like the world's moving to this right now, like this indie creation, you know, just doing it on your own. It was always that thing with the zines and all that stuff growing up in the, like when I was growing up in the nineties and everything, you would see zines everywhere and they were just made by people. And, you know, I had a lot of friends in bands or like there were DJs or something. And you just really had to just figure it all out on your own, like how to get gigs and all that stuff. But I feel like more and more and more, it's really, we have to be our own managers um, and like in the future, it's just, I feel like they're probably going to have better technology to manage all that for themselves. I think that's the important thing uh, for them is just getting down that business side of things because the creative part really is the easiest part. It's, it's hard. It has its challenges, but it's like the easiest part for me. I'd rather be writing all day long, but I can't um, because I've got to like figure out all these little side hustle things that come with the art of writing or drawing or making comics these days. And I have to like really try to figure all that out. But I feel like the next generation of creators and they're already there. I'm older than it all. A lot of the next generation of creators is already. And most of them probably have it down better than me, to be honest, because they grew up with that aesthetic. So I think that's really where just that natural uh, business aspect that's going to be kind of part of the whole package in the future. Having that down more, I think is going to be maybe how they inspire. Like a, a removal of hesitancy of creating, I think has been happening and I think will just continue to happen. So people will be hopefully inspired to be less afraid to put their own stories into the world or their own artwork into the world. Yeah. And I'm hoping that um, the indie publishing just keeps getting bigger and better. And I think all signs point to that happening. So um, it's going to be exciting to see what they do. If your lives were a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Man, my, if my life was a comic book, I'm not sure I'm going to read it, to be honest. <laughs> I feel like I'm always at a desk these days. It would probably be called Desk the Comic Book or something, you know, to be honest. But man, it's, it's soundtrack would be wide and varying because I listen to a lot of different music depending on the task I'm doing. It would be like, you know, I'm writing right now, so I got some jazz. I don't want any lyrics or anything, jazz and soundtrack music. Um, you know, uh, if I'm creating, you know, images for Photoshop or whatever, it'd be probably a bunch of like, uh, um, that re retro synth wave kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, so it'd be kind of varying just depending on the, the task that I was doing in the comic book. Cause I feel like my comic would be comic would be like just a series of tasks. You know? Okay. Yeah. This is a good question and a fun one. I think my comic would be called um, Lady Draws a Lot. Mm -hmm. uh, because one, I do. And then two, that's my name on YouTube. I'll go with that. And then the soundtrack to that would be all over the place. Just, <laughs> yeah. Because depending on the day, I'm listening to one genre over here to this genre over here depending on what I'm drawing, you know, and what mood seems kind of vibe with the art. I listen to a lot of movie scores, actually. Okay. Nice. I think Liddy Draws a Lot would have to be a sequel, though, because you already had a comic about your life. 
<laughs> that's true yeah and it's called momentality she had a comic <laughs> that, she did her own comic strip about motherhood basically and yeah momentality <laughs> that's so true i didn't even Ooh, that just went <laughs> oh well it's just it's like a um it's just like a funny strip about parenting and life as a, a mother basically and uh, obsessions with chocolate and wine and wine yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not a bad combo <laughs> great combination honestly <laughs> Hands off my chocolate. (laughs) Well, John and Michelle, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you both so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having us, man. We appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Before I let you both go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is this campaign uh, for crowdfunding for issue four? And anything else you'd like to promote? The uh, comic, uh, Home Free, uh, the official title is Salt in the Air. We title all our issues. It uh, is going to be funding on Kickstarter. Uh, Otherwise, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Instagram mainly, at Coffee Time Comics with an X, not a CS. And my website's just johncrackey.com if you're interested in diving into like some of my other work that I have on there. Um, And you can find me at comiclodge.com which has, I think, links to all my socials there, but Michelle Lodge Comics otherwise on um, Instagram and Facebook. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O, not the number two, completely different website you don't want to go to. Trust me. But our Mm. website's going through a revamp. Yeah. Our (laughs) website's going through a revamp. So go to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back after 12 or so years. You can find at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search for Two Geeks Talking on your favorite podcast streaming service where you listen to your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.